and was a converted building. The archive at Northampton General and Hospital allows us to reconstruct the 18th century child inpatient and outpatient journey. On the opening day of the infirmary on March the 29th, 1744, the first patient was a child, Thomas and Grace. She was 13 years old and had scald head. But after 100 days of inpatient care, she was discharged, cured. An original print of the infirmary ward for 1745 is very interesting. The ward conditions were very different from now. There were single sex wards, there were no toilets. Each bed had its own chamber pot and patients placed them into a barrel at the end of the ward. Windmills were even tried and even then weren't enough. And that's not all. You were expected to help out in the ward. If you could read or write, you had to teach other patients to do so. The patients admitted were suffering from poverty and years of chronic malnutrition. Children as young as two years of age were seen in outpatients and from eight years of age admitted. Like Thomason, some of their symptoms have lasted many years. Pediatric cases up to and including 16 years of age made up 26% of the number of patients seen for that year. I found out that Thomason had a younger brother called Thomas. On June the 21st, 1746, when he was 13 years old, he was admitted after an accident with a fractured thigh and arm. He was discharged on August the 23rd, cured. I wonder how he managed. I'm Maisie. I've helped make this splint. It's very comfortable. old surgery book. I wonder how Thomas would be cared for today. Well, in this club we can find out. This is a very nasty injury to a child. It would have required a great deal of force. Nowadays most children with this fracture wouldn't be lying in a split or placed in traction for six weeks. So long as the bone is strong, it can be done very much quicker and fix the fracture under anaesthetic. I would use a nail or a plate. At least, it, at least it's under aesthetic. I'm not happy about this family story. It doesn't feel right. Emily, you're the oldest and interested in safeguarding. What do you think? So, we have two children, Thomason and Thomas, both from the same family. One has serious injuries, a fracture.
fractures, and the other has chronic, severe neglect of 11 years. This would be classed as a safeguarding emergency. Sadly, I can't say that this wouldn't still happen in Northampton today. Today, children's safeguarding systems should let these children be identified far sooner and let the hospital be a place of safety. Effective interventions then put into place should allow these children to then grow up in warm, happy and safe environments and have a full life. But it can sometimes work out extraordinarily well. Take Stephen. Hi, I'm Stephen. I want to be an actor when I grow up. And, well, I was adopted at a very young age and, well, wasn't expected to do much. But, thanks to the loving care of my parents, I managed to do quite a lot, actually. I have many dreams that I, I'm sure I'm going to be able to do. And, well, my consultant, Dr. Williams, said that this is, well, the most um, amazing change he's ever seen. <laughs> Northamptonshire Film Archive Trust My Friends They Saved, a 1935 film about Northampton General Hospital. The children seen happy, there were toys. The matron is Miss Eleanor Hay, and her hat is called a wimple. She clearly knows what she's doing. Before the NHS was set up, hospitals were kept going by local funding. That young girl is called Sylvia MacDonald. Her son told me that she lived a full life and was a wonderful mother and grandmother. There's film of light treatment too, the rickets. Paddington Paediatric Ward first opened in 1938. We have a film of Father Christmas coming to visit it in 1963 and giving out presents. <gasps> there you see it, Father Christmas does exist after all. Funding always been a challenge. Florence, you've looked into this. When the Novelton Infirmary first opened, it only treated people who were too poor to be able to afford healthcare for themselves. To be admitted, admitted, patients needed to get two tickets of recommendations for the subscribers to the infirmary. These extremely high mortality rates were mainly the result of infectious diseases worsened by smallpox epidemics on a background of chronic undernutrition and poverty. Social conditions started to slowly improve, but the figure was still 188 deaths out of 100 children in 1878 Northampton. Things continued to get better for more than 100 years until recently. Nearly all medicines were initially made in the infirmary some, and some of the equipment survived this today. Av the average weekly cost of drugs um, was about 9p. The hospital still makes some of its own medicines. Most drugs are made elsewhere. It has to be all very safe and very fast. The infirmary had a herb garden, which was used by the apothecary to make medicine for the patients. In the new building, from 1792, there were intensive grounds that were originally used to grow food for the patients. We have some 1935 films of these gardens. Look at that! We can see large greenhouses. And look at the size of those marrows and that cucumber. You, won't, you wouldn't see that in the supermarket. What are you going to be when you grow up, Ashley? Um, 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 I am going to be... Yeah. A chef? Wow! I'm really interested in food for children that were given a long time ago, as well as today. We have original menus 
news of 1744. Many had some film of food being made in the 1930s. Children need good food to grow and develop properly. There's nothing to stop you from choosing badly. <laughs> The 1744 diet is pretty much the same every single day. That's also right. <laughs> what did you find? We did a dietetic analysis comparing the published 1744 Northampton Infirmary full and milk diets with random choices from Paddington Pediatric Ward. There's loads to choose from now. Well, nutritionally, you do much better on the 1744 diet than you would nowadays. Remember when Thomason was admitted and had to stay for over 100 days? That diet and good hygiene would have cured her. However, on Paddington diet, if she chose badly, she wouldn't even meet minimal requirements for nutrition and her 100 day stay wouldn't have made her any better. So she wouldn't have gone better? I don't think so, especially if she kept picking the jelly and vegetarian option. A while ago, we tried out different diets. Of 1756 paediatric admissions was done by our friend Raymond. The majority 80 plus came from central Northampton with more than five from local areas that are now part of the town. These dots show distribution. It can't be coincidental that there wasn't a single village in the country that was missed out. I agree. The infirmary needed subscriptions from everywhere. If it was seen to be providing care for Northampton and ignoring smaller places, then funds coming from outside Northampton would dry up. Some of my earliest memories are from my time spent being treated for acute leukaemia on the children's ward at Northampton General Hospital. I was just three years old when my treatment began. How different things are now to 50 years ago. Parents couldn't stay with their children then. They were allowed to visit for an hour twice a day. I vividly remember a small storybook that was kept in my bedside locker that I knew when taken out and my parents started reading from it that the end of, the, that the end of visiting was coming and the bell would soon ring. When my parents went to leave I would follow them to the ward gate and would be left bereft. I remember screaming all the way to theatre for my lumbar puncture and bone marrow aspiration. I hated the horrid black rubber anaesthetic mask. I created such a fuss over the months that my doctor eventually agreed with my mum to do the procedure under local anaesthetic on the ward. I remember glass bottles containing IV fluids. I remember being one of the first patients to have radiotherapy at Northampton General Hospital. I remember having ice cream with custard on at lunchtime. I remember being taken to the post-graduation centre to be exhibited at the Grand Round. I remember when I was 18 being told that I could poss not possibly have had a leukaemia at three because I wouldn't have survived. 
Memories that could have given me a fear for all that is within a hospital, yet here I am. When I grow up, I may train to be a nurse. On the opening day of Northampton Infir Infirmary, there were nurses, but they were not trained. They had to be single, over 30 years of age, hard working, kind to the patients and live in the premises. They earn £5 per year with the gratuity of £1 per year if they behave properly. Mrs Esther White was the first ever matron. She earned £10 per year, which included board, lodging and tea allowance. The job of the matron then and now is extremely hard. Mrs Esther White died still in post 1751. Things moved on and the nurses began to be professionally trained. Miley has found some films of nurses being trained in the 1930s. The hours were long and you earned one day off a fortnight. Nurses accommodation at that time was very simple. I know that I will have to work hard in school, university and the wars to become a registered general nurse. They are true professionals. Initially surgery was limited to treating fractures, resetting bones, like Thomas Grayson in 1744. Some of us here have had hip or spinal surgery, but now they're okay. Look at Lucy! Now the word has been reclaimed to affirm full and equal rights. The NCCF ran from 1896 until it became the Manfield Hospital in 1925. In its last year, the NCCF treated over 3,000 children in the entire county. That's really impressive. Especially as it was funded entirely by voluntary donations. Before the NHS was set up, there was little or no state report. The NCCF and hospitals, such as Northampton, were totally dependent on voluntary donations from working men's clubs to individual donors. Mm. We don't often hear about this, about real people who made this happen. For the one such was Miss Ellen Fitz Roberts Robinson. You can see her in the newspaper cutting on the last days of the NCCF. She, de she devoted 40 years her life to ensure people, poor Northamptonshire children with disabilities obtain the, possible, the best possible care. The ledgers have survived. These have a lot of medical information. Individual records contain beautiful hand-drawn illustrations, photographs and some x-rays. The NCCF registers demonstrate non-surgical treatments such as splints, bracing, special boots. Before antibiotics were discovered, operations were risky, but some were performed. Now this work continues at Manfield Operating Theatre at Northampton General Hospital. Edward Jenner's 1798 discovery using cowpox inoculation meant smallpox mortality fell from 31% and small un un unvaccinated children uh, compared to the 1.2% to the inoculated. Imagine that, that would be amazing. Here is the original inoculation but um, here are some it entries. In 1806, there was a scare about an uh, inoculation leading to the death of a child, Peter Bell. The hospital did an investigation. Peter's parents signed the statement. A false and groundless report has been spread around this neighbourhood and town that our son, Peter Bell, 
died on the 6th of January from the smallpox after being inoculated at the infirmary. We do hereby declare that neither the child named above or our child Annabelle ever had smallpox or ever had the symptoms or appearances of smallpox. Both our children were inoculated for the cowpox and they both came through that disease. Peter, the youngest, uh, always been a weakly child, had better health after he had the cowpox than ever he enjoyed beforehand until he was seized by a violent complaint of his bowel and died. <laughs> Smallpox was eliminated worldwide 200 years later, but this is not the end of the story. There are other deadly diseases. The oldest archive report for Northampton for the year 1881 and showed that 111 people died of measles in this town. It's such a shame that measles was preventable. Nowadays we are protected from a whole range of killer diseases. Living in Northampton, like the rest of the UK, we're not really used to seeing these diseases. So we, we can tell these diseases are very devastating and that we can lose sight and that the vaccines are important. If we just took measles in the 1960s, here in the UK, there were hundreds and thousands. But immunizations just reduced this to hundreds. I don't like needles like anyone else. Trust me, he really doesn't like needles. I was brave to, to have the job to keep me safe. In addition to Paddington Ward, recent developments include a paediatric admission unit and a paediatric accident and emergency unit. We need to mention the Child Development Centre. It's one of the earliest in the country since 1974. It's been helping children with learning or social difficulties. It also has a sensory room, which looks great fun. My name is Stephen. I was born 11 weeks early and I'm alive because of premature baby units in Northampton. There was a premature baby unit from 1947. At that time, a premature, a premature baby was defined being under five and a half pounds. It shows the full premature baby care pathways from that time. Jaundice, yellowness in newborn babies, is very common but it sometimes can cause serious problems. Dr Gossett invented an acrometer, leading to an important 1960 Lancet publication. It was placed on a newborn baby's nose and any yellowness, jaundice, matched to the one of these yellow strips. It was quick, effective and saved a lot of unnecessary blood tests and there was worldwide interest. And our friend Claire has mapped the correspondent that shows us how international medicine is. We can forget how quickly things have changed. So the collection also includes personal testimonies such as from a retired premature baby sister, Sister Phyllis Henbest, about premature baby care in the pre-ventilation era. During this time, we had our successes and our sorrows. We had so little we could do for so many babies especially the preterm babies. The leading authority at the time advised us not to feed the small premature babies for five days. I only had the courage to do that for three days. There was no means of assessing oxygen in the blood. Apart from babies of the diabetic mothers, there was no investigation of blood sugar or calcium levels. Dr Gossett set up the premature baby unit in Northampton, which was named after him. His daughter remembers taking this photograph in the garden terrace of his home, Vigo House. 
It was taken where the Crip Centre was now. It was a late spring day about tea time. How many your babies like me are alive because of modern intensive care? Survival and outcomes have improved enormously over the last 50 years. However, it's not all about modern equipment and treatment. We now know that gentler care practices and keeping the whole family at the centre of what we do offers the best environment for the baby's development. The voice of the disabled are being increasingly heard and decisive in making old choices about how to live their lives. What all this is about is allowing children to live their full lives. So what happened to the first Northampton infirmary patient, Thomas and Grace Ewan? Well, we have her marriage certificate. Look, she's now moved to London, wrote her name. This is more than a hundred years before compulsory schooling. Here is her death certificate. We know she married a second time and died in 1802, aged 71 years. I, I like to think Thomason led a full life. Although this film has been about 275 years of hospital child health care at Northampton, this is not the full picture for Northampton or indeed anywhere else. The health of children and young people is determined by far more than health care alone. We're coming near the end of our film now. We've seen how the health care of children has improved tremendously over 275 years. It's, it's by no means all about technology. Or the creation of paediatric departments. The greatest benefits are seen through ample quality, good food, clean water, sanitation, female education and then immunisation. Other important factors we know are household income, housing, stable and loving family life and a healthy environment. All these significantly influence young people's health and life chances. <laughs> Better health care can never fully compensate for the health impact of these wider economic and social influences. So it can't just be solved by antibiotics or new facilities. It's clearly so much more. Child health care is due to an ongoing, ongoing battle. In the UK, there are 15.5 million children and young people likely under 20 years old. If we forget the lessons of the past, it is all too possible what was seen before will return. Well, it's been a busy day. You would never guess it. My span has also been sorted. I tend to live a full life. I hope you do too. There's still far more to learn. When my consultant first saw my brain scan, he feared I'd never walk, talk, or live in walk, talk, see, or live an independent life. My consultant didn't understand and put this down to the selfless love of my parents. Steven! Sorry, gotta go. Mm.